And what is up guys, Technicals Tinkers here, checking in on our little 3D print operation for the day. If you're new to the channel, uninitiated or unfamiliar, I do 3D printing here at home, stuff to improve my life, fix stuff around the house, sell for money, maybe, or just generally show off and have a good time. If you're interested in any of those things, be sure to subscribe to the channel. What is that I hear? Could it be? Could it be an operational Arnstorm Giga? That's right. Coming off the heels of the last vlog you saw, I had my bench. Where's my benchy? Where's my snare? The benchy that I swore up and down that I would save and frame, I guess I threw it away. But we did get a couple more prints off the machine. All right, I know. So if you saw my post on YouTube, you saw that I posted this here Orca Cube. It's kind of like a uh, basic design that a lot of people print for testing their printers. Now, you might say, that thing looks like shit. It kind of does, yeah. If it, like if it was coming off of like a brand new Core XY 250 millimeter machine, but this compared to the stuff I was getting, show some samples here is a, a, a massively improved. So if you take a look at this, there's some ringing. Yes, there's some signs of like ghosting or uh, what do you call it, benchy hole line, things like that. Uh, no input shaping on this machine. So I do have a beacon with the Rev H but you gotta go through and install all this kind of stuff to do it. And I've got a little Discord chat going with people who have done the conversion. And there's a very nice gentleman in there who's kind of helping me and another guy dial in our beacons. And I think I'm gonna migrate it over to the, where it touches, which gives me a lot of pause. It's not something that I wanna do like on my own because I don't know nearly enough to try to calibrate something like that. That gives me the heebie-jeebies when the nozzle be touching my $370 PEI sheet. My Z offset's kind of okay for now, so I'm waiting for like some more clarity or confidence on that before I proceed that route. Also, doing uh, calibrating the accelerometer in the beacon so I can do input shaping, resonance testing, things like that should eliminate a lot of the ghosting. Just kind of examining this, I posted this, you know, on YouTube to see if people can like give me some some helps and tips because I was having over extrusion and under extrusion badly at the same time, no matter how, what I was doing. Where, do I have any of those things? I've been kicking them all over the place. Can I get all mad about it and start kicking them? These little, um, you know, these little pucks for flow testing that Orca gives you. You know, I would just, obviously I stopped the print on this, but the, uh, the surface quality, like the top layer, you're not gonna be able to see that. You are digging in the trash. Reminds me of somebody else. <laughs> No. And so traction testing, basically the same no matter what. This is actually one of the better examples of the flow test. You know, the line in here, let's give it something to focus against. The line in there in the center is pretty good, but still globby as hell. There's signs of uh, under extrusion all over the place. In the end, and I don't know if I'm, ca if I'm dialed in yet, I really don't. Maybe I'm 13% confident that I'm, I'm on the right track. I just found something that works and I'm going with that for now because I need to keep moving the chains forward. What really did it was turning down the temperature. Previous Armstrong Giga, itty bitty baby print, well not an itty baby print head, but compared to this thing, this is a, um, you know, this is a F350. The previous, the Armstrong Giga print head was an F150. And you know, other types of print heads are Toyota Camrys, I guess. So this thing has a bigger uh, heating sort of area in the tube for filament to heat up. And so I don't really need to run it at 220 degrees uh, in order to achieve the speeds like with the old system. I can run it much lower because it's just more badass. And so I turn the temperatures way down. I'm running at 180, 190 now at like 200, 250 millimeters per second, and I'm getting much better results. Also, I turned on pressure advance. Why wouldn't you turn on pressure advance before? Well, a lot of people were telling me like, no, 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 you need to get basically perfect prints before you turn on pressure advance, and then that takes you to the next level. And so I was kind of operating in that mode, and it was just like, oh, I can't turn it on. I gotta you know, do all this other stuff first. I just turned it on, turned down the temps, and I'm getting pretty good prints. And so this is obviously, you know, leaves a lot to be desired, but it's a 0.3 layer height, 0.6 line width. Um, it's pretty good. And so I'm doing some other prints now. I've got a bed scraper going on here. I've actually never printed a bed scraper in my entire 3D printing career. Got one going there. Flashforge 85N Pro doing some ABS prints. The blade for the bed scraper, figured I'd do that in ABS. I've also got Another little thing here, which is a Giga support item, 
to support my new Infinity Flow S1 Plus. So I've got it all set up here. Filament Cutters V2, Infinity Flow integral part of the Armstorm Giga. Absolute requirement, if you ask me, having an automatic filament reload in here. So what I'm gonna do is because I was always having trouble with, you know, length of this thing, I'm actually just gonna replace the grommet that I have up here. See if I can get you a better angle. So this is the glory hole where the filament comes through from the top. And it's just, you know, a little grommet that passes the filament through. And previously that's where I was running the PTFE tube from. And so I figured, you know what? Instead of having it dangle all around, let's put a connector in the grommet. And so that's exactly what I'm doing over here. So this is basically this thing, just with a big cylinder around it. And that way I can connect the PTFE tube in the top here down to the print head. And that length of tube never moves. It's just connected to two different points at the exact length that it needs to be. And as it goes up, it's short enough to where it's not gonna interfere. Also, because up here, I was having a lot of trouble with the tube bending a little too aggressively. So that can be a little more, more better. If it doesn't work, then we can go back to the previous configuration, but anxious to get the Infinity Flow S1 Plus set up. If you want one of these, link in the description below. Ultra super hella recommend. It's an absolute game changer as far as I'm concerned. If you're doing any kind of prints that chew through a lot of filament and you're not like always at your printer, uh, it just, just get it. Raspberry Pi screen working out great. Got all the wires chased in. You might notice here too, I've got my Brio set up. And no, I'm not talking about Brio, that uh, six out of 10 Italian restaurant. I got it here from a webcam. So hopefully this weekend being able to set up time lapses, but you know, in terms of quality, fantastic quality on the Brio, 30 frames per second. Gonna try to get Moonraker configured and set up uh, for the nice smooth time lapses. And additionally, I made the little bracket here that rides on the gantry. So as the print rises, the camera rises with it. And so it will kind of view the print as it moves along. So you'll get this nice hello kind of thing as it moves up. Not a lot of weight on that either. So it's not gonna impact the back to front Z tilt shift of the gantry as it moves up. Also super special shout out to my sponsors here, the people who have been helping me along the way. I figured I'd promo them by sticking their sticker on the machine. So check out filamenthub.au, 3D by D, LTX Designs, and our title sponsors, Raytheon and BlackRock. We reached out to Northrop Grumman, but they didn't return my calls. I'm not sure why. It's probably that whole of trying to get into Area 51 thing, I don't know. So obviously the gig had taken up the lion's share of attention for a while now, but we're getting close lads. We're getting real close. I can feel it. This print took about an hour uh, and no issues along the way. And so I'm getting, my confidence level is increasing with the Giga being able to let it kind of print unattended because every other print I've been like in here watching it, waiting for a fire to break out. I'm getting a lot more confidence in it. So good things. Over here on the P1P, that's right, another character model, short content, uh, courtesy of Dinamo 3D. Let's go check out what else I got going on in that realm. All right, and so over here on the Bamboo A1, doing a time lapse uh, for another part of that model. Let's put it up right here. So this is a vault girl from Fallout, the game, the TV series, the, you know, the, the uh, universe, I guess. Fallout, very popular, new season coming out sometime, I'm not sure when exactly, but people are interested in Fallout. So I figured I'd do one of these. Dinamo 3D, he's the one behind the Biker Peach and the Tatsuma, the Tornado model that I did shorts for and briefly kind of went over in the vlog. I don't know, they're a little suggestive in terms of models, but you know, I guess people are the people, I'm interested in that, they look cool. So I'm printing those over here. He was uh, pleased, I guess, with the Biker Peach and the Tornado model. And so I asked him like, hey, I'll print and showcase them and link to you send me some more models. And so he sent me several models, great designer. And it's kind of a, you know, this is kind of a pseudo promo thing. There's no money going back and forth or anything. I'm generating content. He's getting promo. He sells the models and these are pricey models. You get several different variants in there, including like NSFW versions and things like that, but the regular ones as well. And it's been kind of a stark contrast for a lot of the other I guess art models that I've gotten in the past, which have been off Maker World, Thingiverse, places like that. The difference between, again, and this is just anecdotal, you know, single incident sort of thing, but the designs that are coming out of someone who charges a lot of money and clearly spends a lot of time in their models 
versus just the stuff you get off Maker World and Thingiverse is night and day, really. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Like the parts of the model, um, in I really recognize it when it comes down to the painting. So this is like a, uh, a device, it's called a pit boy in the game. Uh, when you go to paint it, you can clear, you can see very clear demarcations in the parts of the model. And so when you go to paint it, it makes it so much easier to paint these parts because you can just grab your, uh, your fill tool and it will snap to the line. A lot of models that are organic, uh, let's, you know, probably a good example over here on her face. So like, you know, when you go into paint her lips, there's no fill line for it to grab onto. And so when you go to do this, you have to do it kind of by hand. Um, and a lot of models are just like that all over. Uh, you know, and it comes with the territory I feel in my experience with these organic models when you're going to paint them in, in Bamboo Studio. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, a designer will I optimize it for FDM and make the lines really clean or these are like, you know, parts of the model that are independently designed and then bolted on so the program can, I'm not sure exactly how it figures out where the line is, what the algo is, but you can tell that, that there was a lot of forethought going into this when they made it because you know for instance here are the shoelaces they painted up very cleanly just with the fill tool additionally a lot of the parts of the model are you know they're broken up to where you know like her hand is predominantly flesh colored and her sleeve is not and so they separate those two parts instead of making it one part and then suddenly you're only able to print in four colors but if it's a hand and a sleeve that needs five colors to look correct then that's gonna create some challenges and then you're gonna to have to do manual edits. But d design like this, it's just kind of like illuminating to me. It's like you really get what you pay for in some regards when you get these nicer models. And I'm sure that extends to other types of art models, not just like character models like this, but it's really kind of a, a different story. So if you wanna check out DMO 3D, uh, link in the description below. You know, start, they are expensive models. They're like, you know, 15 to or 10 to $20, let's say. But there's lots of variants. They are nice models. I don't, you can't sell them, I don't think. But you know, if you're looking for one of these, you know, go for it. He actually sent me this one too. This is an OC model. He made this. It's not based off like a universe or a character or anything like that. He just made it up and he's like, yeah, I'd like to see what you can do with this. And so this one is, <laughs> the, this, this one might take a little while because this is a like a eight legged horse with this like Viking princess on it. And there's just so many colors and so much detail. But looking over the model, it looks like it'll be easy to paint. It's just, it's just a lot. And so it's gonna be many, many plates over many, many days to do it. But I am anxious to do that. Wanted to get one of these uh, more fan service-y, crowd pleaser -y type of prints out first. The Vault Girl, there's a Balzette uh, that I think I'm gonna do. Uh, but the other models that he's done are very cool as well. Other notable mentions too, I got a, uh, <laughs> an Ace, I'm a Mac guy. I don't know if you guys knew that. I'm a Mac guy through and through. Um, but I have PC, my main computer is a PC, uh, just for flexibility, but for like phone, tablets, you know, my company runs completely on Macs. Um, I got this so I could interface with the Giga and run terminal and main, so I just, this is, this is a Giga computer. So this is, I bought a laptop for the Armstrong Giga, yes. Because the iPad that I'm using in there, that's my email machine, I need that here. And so I got this $300 holler on Amazon, link in the description below, I guess, if you wanna buy it. But another kind of thing I didn't know, and maybe that would be a loose recommendation for anyone looking to set up their gig or whatever, is if you're spending all this money, maybe consider a computer that just goes with the printer that you can have just sitting on the printer. You know, say, I'm not buying a whole computer. It was like, you know, two, 300 bucks. It was really, really cheap. But I did notice, and I didn't know that Windows was doing this or Acer or whatever, because I don't ever buy off the shelf PCs. I always build them. Uh, building PCs is super ultra fun to me. I love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. And it's really disappointing when I finish the build because it's like, all right, I don't get to build it anymore. The laptops is a different story. They come everything baked in. So, can't see my... And so, uh, when I got this, you know, what's the first thing you do when you get a brand new computer? Install Chrome and turn off Edge. Don't let you do that. Uh, it's kind of got a baked in thing and I think that's why it was so cheap. It's like, uh, okay, you can do that, but you gotta buy a Windows license if you wanna install not Edge. Um, Who's using Edge? There's only one kind of Edge I'm interested in, and it ain't the guitarist from U2. So anyway, uh, recommend this, but also if I did one of these on my crypto channel, this is a uh, Windows 11 um, 
it, it's wrapped in red tape for a reason. It's an auto installer, so you plug it in and turn it on your computer, it is 100% automated, so you cannot stop it. It's a nuclear bomb for your computer. Uh, it automatically installs Windows 11, bypasses the login restrictions, inserts all the configs, no bloat, all that kind of stuff. Super ultra handy to have one of these. So check out my other channel or let me know in the comments if you want like a link to the guide on how to make one of these. But got that set up here updating. So this will be the Giga machine. Thought that was a nice touch because you know, this is a cheap laptop. It seems to seems to be okay. I'm not gonna run any slicing software. Maybe, I guess. I mean, maybe if like I just direct all its resources at Orca. Maybe it can handle it. Do all the actual work over here and then just throw the files onto here remotely. But thought that was a nice touch as well. Sort of the final thing I've been working on is like I've been talking about doing a video as a quasi tutorial for the Blue Storm Terra conversion. I'm trying to put this thing together and I'm thinking maybe it's a bad idea, but there's no content around it. I can just, I, the only thing I can do is make a video on what I did. Problem is, is that it's constantly changing. For instance, building the Luke's tool head, I used the Giga tool board uh, that is part of the guide, but then realized like this is not as good as using an EBB 42. So I went back, but I had already shot the assembly with the Giga tool board. And so you could see, well, am I gonna take this entire thing apart again and then re-put it together using the EBB 42 or do I just put a footnote or just cut that part out and skip straight to it but then you miss all the other steps. It's very complicated. I know that's not a problem that a lot of people really even really consider. It's like, well, you're the guy making videos. It's up to you to figure out, but this is the meta of the vlog and so I'm talking about it. But it becomes very difficult and especially with the configuration because I've gone through so many of the configs, everyone's settings are gonna be different. Case in point, LGX Pro Extruder from Bontech, from Luke's lab, everybody says the rotation distance is 7.805. I got that tattooed on my brain. But as I came to find out after doing several tests, mine needs to be dialed down to 7.13 something or other. And so my rotation distance was wrong. And so I had to change that. How do I bake that in if everyone else's settings is gonna be the same? Again, is it a footnote? Is it gonna make it more confusing? Are people gonna go through the video and say like, wow, this guy had a really hard time doing this because I'm stupid and then they don't wanna do it, but there's no other content out there. And again, I'm trying, I'm really tr kind of finding out why there isn't a lot of content in this realm because a lot of it is just so situational, so much context, so much your mileage may vary uh, in this arena. I'm thinking that's why a lot of people aren't doing that, but I'm gonna put something out regardless. Um, you know, maybe there'll be a part two with configuration settings. Certainly we'll cover it on the vlog. Appreciate any insight, thoughts, or opinions you guys have on that. But that's what's going on in additive manufacturing land for the day. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below. Be sure to like the video because it's the nice thing to do. And of course, subscribe for more content like this. I'm Tentacles, see you next time.